All right, well, welcome to our Sunday evening service for Cops Road Chapel, and uh, welcome to all our regulars, members, and friends, and those visiting. And uh, welcome also to anybody listening later to this service on YouTube or on our audio recording. Um, it's, uh, it's really good to be together again to enjoy fellowship and to hear from God's word. So I'm going to hand over to Sukesh, who's going to lead the meeting for us. Over to you, Sukesh. Thank you, Andrew. Yes, good evening. Welcome. Lovely to see you all. And uh, if you're unable to join us live and you'll be watching later, then we trust and pray that the Lord will bless you as you gather with us for worship. We're going to begin with a word of prayer. Let's pray together. Our God, our Father, we thank you again for this opportunity on the Lord's Day to come as a fellowship of your people into your very presence. We thank you, Lord, for the many blessings that we enjoy as your people. We thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ, and we thank you for the salvation that is in him. And we thank you, Lord, for the way that you've blessed us through Christ. We thank you for the Lord's Day and for the blessing it is for us to meet, that we might worship together and study your word together. And we pray, our Father, for your blessing upon us. We pray that the Holy Spirit of God himself might come to visit us. There might be a sense of the presence of God in our midst today as we gather. So, Lord, bless us, we pray, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our first hymn speaks about God, our Father, and in fact, it's to the triune God, and it is the hymn, Glory Be to God. It's lovely to have uh, Alex and Francis with us tonight, and a little bit later, uh, Alex will be sharing 
uh, for us, but he is going to read the scriptures for us now. Well, please uh, turn in your Bibles to uh, the Epistle of Jude, um, Jude and uh, verse 17. Yeah, Jude verse 17, reading um, right through to the end of the, the book. Yes, we're just waiting for the um, text to come up on the screen. Well, okay, if, um, if you have your Bibles in front of you, please turn to Jude 17. Uh, here we are, great, okay. <laughs> but you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people, devoid of the spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Saviour, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Thank you, Alex. As I say, a little later, Alex will be sharing a bit more uh, about their plans for us. We're going to sing again uh, a lovely hymn uh, about God's love for us and about our love for the Lord himself. My faith looks up to thee.
Well, as I said, it's lovely to have Alex and Francis uh, with us here in Clevedon. Welcome. Uh, there are some major changes, some very interesting changes happening in Alex and Francis's life in the coming months. And I thought because we do pray for them, it would be good to hear from Alex what their plans are in the coming months. Welcome, Alex. Thank you, Sukesh. And it is um, really good to be uh, with you all this evening. We are um, down visiting uh, my family in Cleveland. The first opportunity we'd have been able to do that, really. Um, um, I appreciate all of your, your prayers um, and, and love very much. I was thinking earlier that really it's coming up to five years since um, I finished being at Cops Road, apart from a, a short spell after coming back from India. And it's been been a time of blessing and challenge and um, uh, this year particularly has been quite exciting. It's, it's been a difficult time for many and the lockdown has been very strange but God has blessed me and has blessed us and we've been really blessed to be married as, as you know um, and after a number of years of considering it carefully and looking for opportunities um, I'm delighted to be able to say that um, I'm going to be starting as a minister of minister in training so training for Christian ministry um, at a church in Edinburgh called a Bellevue Chapel. So that's um, a big step. Um, I'll be working for the church part time and uh, studying part time over four years for a, a theology degree at um, Edinburgh Theological Seminary, which is part of the, the Free Church of Scotland. So um, that's very exciting. We're just starting to learn a little bit about the responsibilities and the, the opportunities that we're going to have at Bellevue. Um, it's a church of about um, 120 or so people, um, really quite central in Edinburgh, just on the north side of the centre, um, friendly, um, committed to teaching the Bible, um, and with just a really lovely group of people. So we're, we're really excited about that. And uh, for both of us, I guess it's, it's moving church. And for me, I'm moving a church I've been at for four years, and they've been a real blessing to me. And for Francis, it's, it's moving after a couple of years. But the time, we're convinced that this is where the Lord has called us. We're um, excited about it and grateful, I think, for the opportunity. And um, I'll be getting involved in some a variety of things, but uh, young adult work and helping the church think a bit more about discipleship, a little preaching, going to various meetings in various groups, and, and probably studying quite hard as well. So um, we'd really value your prayers. I think it's a really good opportunity to join a church that's um, serious about reaching out to um, it's community with the gospel um, and with a wise pastor, Christian, a Dutch pastor who was pastored in Ireland and Scotland and um, uh, overseas. So we're, we're, we're very much looking forward to that. And I'm really looking forward to learning from him and to um, learning what it means to be a pastor over the next uh, four years or so. So it's great to be able to give you an update. It's good to be with you and with value your prayers I think just as I make a huge change from leaving accounting and start something completely new and clearly there's a certain nervousness around that um, and perhaps also pray um, I've had some encouraging conversations with people at work when they've heard I'm going off to go into church ministry and virtually all of them have been kind of wow it's great that you, you can go and do that there's sort of very not really been any negative reactions people are sort of amazed that I can leave a good job and go off and do what, what I really want to do. And, and there have been a few conversations around the gospel and people's own attitude to church and church upbringings and things. And perhaps pray that some of those would get picked up in the next three weeks. I finish at the end of July and lead to um, some of my colleagues coming to know the Lord. That would be great. Thanks, Sukesh. Thank you, Alex. Do please keep us uh, updated. We will be much in prayer for you. And uh, Alex and Francis are coming for a brief visit again in a few weeks. And, uh, and then, uh, well, God willing, in August, uh, they'll be starting that very exciting chapter in their ministry. It's quite a thing to get married and leave your job and begin ministerial, ministerial training all in one year. The Lord has been so, so good to you. We rejoice with you. And uh, we will be much in prayer for you. Do please keep us updated throughout your time of training we will be of course in prayer for you as you undertake that we're going to pray now let's pray together our god and our father we do thank you for your grace and your goodness and we thank you our father for the holy spirit who is at work 
in building your kingdom here on earth. We thank you for that promise the Lord Jesus Christ made. I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And we thank you, our Father, that you are at work in calling young men into the ministry and uh, equipping them for the gospel ministry. We rejoice in that, Lord, and we pray for more and more young men, Lord, in this country to be called of the Spirit. We remember, Lord, how throughout history he has uh, identified men in the ministry, in the churches, and called them and equipped them and used them mightily, Lord. And we yearn for more and more young men to hear that call of God and to obey and to come into the ministry to be trained. We thank you for Alex and Francis, Lord. We thank you for the way that you blessed them so wonderfully this year, Lord, in bringing them together in marriage. What a lovely thing that is. Our hearts are filled with joy when we think of the way that you've blessed them and watched over them. Thank you, Lord, for their marriage. Thank you that they are now a married couple. Thank you that this lockdown wasn't able to prevent that, that wedding ceremony from taking place. And we thank you, Lord, that they're now joyfully uh, working together for the glory of God and serving together in their current church. And we pray for them, Lord, as they finish their ministry in Chalmers. And we thank you for that church, Lord. Thank you for the way that they've taken Alex and Francis under their wing and discipled them. Thank you that Alex has found a home there at Chalmers. And thank you, Lord, for the eldership team there who have been such a blessing to him. And our Father, we thank you for this uh, church, Belmont. We thank you, Lord, for their desire to train this young man for the ministry. Thank you, Lord, for the vision that they have to take him on and uh, support him in this way. And we rejoice with you, with them, Lord, that you have called Alex to this ministry. We pray for that church, Lord, and we pray that the members, the leadership team, the elders will be fully behind this. We pray that they might get along really well, Lord. There might be no friction anywhere. But when Alex and Francis join that church, they'll be warmly welcomed. They'll be taken in as part of the fellowship. And may they, Lord, be united as one body, serving our Lord Jesus. We pray for the current eldership there, Lord. We thank you for their commitment in taking on Alex as a trainee. We pray that they would get along well, Lord, uh, that there would be an open, frank, friendly relationship between them. And we pray, our Father, that those elders will be consistently prayerful and consistently supportive and consistently sensitive, Lord, as Alex undertakes this task. We pray that they would do nothing to discourage him. They wouldn't be in any way insensitive, Lord, but we pray that they would be fully supportive, pastoral, uh, and uh, also offering wisdom in the pastoral work. We pray for the uh, training that will take place at the seminary, Lord, and we thank you for that provision of a college there. We pray for Alex as he will be undertaking these studies. Lord, please help him, we pray, uh, to study well. Help him, Lord, to be an exemplary student there and to help other students to be a good member of the student body, to fit in well, to be a joy and an encouragement to his lecturers and to be a help to his fellow students. May that be a joyful time, Lord, not a, a difficult time, not an irksome time, but a joyful time of studying your word. We pray that that college will be committed to the scriptures and committed to Christ and committed to Christ as Savior. And we pray that together they would work well to train Alex. We pray for his work in the church, for the preaching, for the ministry among the young adults, whatever other work there is, Lord, outreach among the community. Will you, Lord, bless mightily we pray for the Holy Spirit to come upon that church and to work, Lord, in such a wonderful way that they will see much fruit, they will see growth in those who are believers, that they might grow in their knowledge, in their love, and in their faith. We pray, Lord, for those who are outside the church, that they might hear the gospel and might be converted. May that church prosper. Thank you, Lord, for Alex's time here at COPS. 
Thank you, Lord, for his time there in India. And now a new chapter begins. We pray, Lord, for your blessing upon Alex and Francis. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, before we come to the Word of God, we're going to sing uh, a lovely hymn all the way. My Savior leads me. Now please turn with me in your Bibles to the passage uh, that we read a little earlier from the letter that Jude wrote and uh, Alex read for us from verse 17. But actually, of course, we have got right to the end of the letter. And this evening, we are looking at the last two verses, what is called the doxology or the glory or the blessing uh, the last two verses, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. We've been studying the letter of Jude for a number of weeks, and we've seen that uh, this letter was written because there were these false teachers who had 
got into local churches. He actually says they crept in unnoticed into local churches. We don't know where these churches were that Jude wrote to, but there were these churches and there was a group of people who held false views, false doctrine, false teaching from the Bible, and they had false practices, unbiblical practices. And these people had come to these local churches, and they had found them their way into these local churches. They had crept in unnoticed, and they had begun to influence the congregation. They'd begun to perhaps spread their teaching to the congregation, and they'd begun to influence the behavior of the people in these local churches. And so it came to the notice of Jude that there are these churches where these people with false practices, false doctrines have crept in and they're beginning to have an influence. Now, this is a very serious matter. The local church is the body of Christ here on earth. Uh, our biggest problem, one of our biggest problems today, is we have a low view of the local church. And we have a low view of membership in the local church and fellowship in the local church. And that's disastrous for the Christian life. In the New Testament, living the Christian life and being committed as a member of a local church, the two were indistinguishable. You can't distinguish these two things in the New Testament. The New Testament knows nothing, nothing of a Christian who is not committed to a local church and uses their gifts in one local church and commits themselves to that one body. And today we don't hold such views. Uh, the whole doctrine of the church is today uh, very weak in evangelical Christianity. I was reading something that um, John Stott, the late John Stott, uh, wrote towards the end of his life. He died quite recently. And John Stott said, today, if I was beginning my ministry, the first thing that I would preach about is the local church and the importance of the local church. Isn't that interesting? I think he was in his late 80s, early 90s, and he obviously had a good grasp of the evangelical scene in Britain. And this is what he said. He said, if I was beginning today, if I was back at All Souls Langdon Place and beginning my preaching ministry, my first series would be on the importance of the local church. So local churches are hugely important. We mustn't downplay them. We mustn't in any way demean them. We mustn't just think, well, it doesn't matter if I'm a member or not, if I'm committed to one church or not, or I flit about. These things are hugely important. And these local churches had come under this attack. The devil had attacked them, and these people had crept in unnoticed, and they had begun to influence the local body of believers. Now, in this passage, in this letter, rather, Jude first talks about these people. And from verse 3, he says to them, I was going to write to you about our common salvation, but I've changed my mind. I'm going to write about uh, the faith that was once delivered to the saints and how you must contend for that faith because these people have crept in unnoticed. And he talks about their character. We've spent a number of weeks studying this letter, and we've looked at the character of this, these false teachers. And that passage has gone all the way from 5 up to 16, the character of these false teachers. And then we saw last week, from 17 to 23, he speaks about how Christians are to live in the light of these people. What are Christians to do, given the fact that people who hold false doctrine, people who have false practices, unbiblical practices, have crept in into the local churches and noticed, what are Christians to do? And we looked at that last week from 17 to 23. And then Jude finishes his letter 
with these very, very famous verses. These verses are so well known because often when a service ends, uh, the minister will read these words. Uh, and they are words of encouragement for God's people. It is actually words that were designed for that one purpose, that they might encourage God's people. Jude is very sensitive, and he has written a tough letter. Uh, I think you would agree, as we've gone through this letter, in fact, I've had conversations with people, and that adjective, it's been a tough letter, has come through again and again. Uh, we've found it difficult going through this letter. There are difficult things here. There are challenging things here. And Jude has written quite a tough letter. But Jude, like the other writers of the New Testament, is pastoral. He has a pastoral heart. And he knows that these readers need to be encouraged. He doesn't want to just throw out challenges. He doesn't just want to say things which might cause anxiety. He wants to finish with words of encouragement. And basically, he finishes with words of praise to God. That's, a, that's how he finishes. These are actually designed to bring praise to God. They're written for worship of God, to give praise to God. Now to him. And there's a little word that can be put in, although it isn't there in the text. Now praise to him, or glory be to him. Because that is how it is. So we could say, well, praise be to him, or may glory be to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. So he finishes the letter by giving thanks to God, by ascribing glory to God. Why? What is his reason? Well, we're going to work our way through these two verses, and we're going to look at these reasons. They are encouraging for us. They will help us in our Christian lives, particularly as you've been listening to the teaching, and you're thinking to yourself, well, there's a lot of teaching out there on the internet. And I do access sermons, and I do listen to things. And here, I'm listening to this letter, that there are these people who have crept in unnoticed. Uh, and they are disseminating uh, um, unbiblical teaching, uh, and they're handing out unbiblical practices as an example. Well, does that mean that my Christian life is in jeopardy? Or does that mean that I will be misled? Does that mean that I will lose my salvation? Is this what Jude is about? And so these uh, words of praise to God are written that they might encourage us. So Jude finishes the letter by giving thanks to God. Now, what does he give thanks to God for? Well, if you look at verse 24, you will see that there are two things there for which he gives thanks to God. He says, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. He is able to keep you from stumbling. He's speaking here about God's protecting power upon his people. There is an enormous amount of false teaching out there. If you just uh, begin with the label religious teaching, there's a huge amount of religious teaching on the internet. You know, you can go on site and listen to Muslim preachers preaching Islam. You can go on site and listen to Hindu yogis preaching Hinduism. You can go to sites where the Jehovah's Witnesses are giving their teaching. Mormons are giving their teaching. Seventh-day Adventists are giving their teaching. Roman Catholics are giving their teaching. All kinds of teaching is out there. And if you say to yourself, well, I'm an evangelical Christian, so I'm not going to listen to all these. I'm going to listen to what is called evangelical preaching, where the person professes to believe the Bible, and I will listen to them. But even there, we have to be very careful. 
I wish I could say to you that every person who calls himself an evangelical is safe to listen to. And you know very well that isn't the case. Because, of course, a very clever false teacher will profess to be an evangelical, will profess to be a teacher of the Bible and a person who expounds the scriptures, but actually is there with ill design, with deceitful heart. And so we, it is a concerning situation. And Jude says, yes, it is concerning, but God is able to keep you from stumbling. In other words, he says, if you pray and ask the Lord to guide you, you pray and ask the Lord to watch over you, you ask him that he will watch over you as you access teaching, God will keep you from stumbling. Now, I'm not saying you will hear a voice from heaven saying this website is good and that teacher is good. But you know how the Holy Spirit does guide us. We can't discount the work of the Holy Spirit in guiding his people. And if you are hungry for teaching, and you want teaching on a certain topic, you can ask people, or you will come across teaching. Perhaps you're in a conversation with somebody, and they'll say, well, it's very interesting. You want to listen to preaching on Sermon on the Mount. And it's so interesting. I found a, a website where the guy has been preaching on the Sermon on the Mount, and it's good, solid stuff. And as you listen to preaching, now this is something that the Apostle John says in his letter, in his first letter. And John says that the Holy Spirit of God who lives in us will guide us with regard to these things. And it so often does happen. You listen to teaching. And you come away and you think, I don't think that is right, you know. I just don't think that is right. Now, I'm not saying we go by these feelings completely. But I am saying that God is able to keep us from stumbling. That doesn't mean you will never be led astray by a false teacher. That doesn't mean you will never click into a website where there is a false teacher and perhaps for a while be led by them. But it does mean that you won't continue to be there under the influence of a false teacher. God will see to it. That doesn't mean we can be careless. It doesn't mean you can just listen to anybody and everybody and it doesn't matter. But it does mean that if you do find yourself listening to somebody who isn't a fault, who isn't a good teacher, isn't faithful to the word of God, you won't come under their influence over a long period of time. In some way, God will step in and God will protect you. So we must always be careful. I'm not in any way downplaying our role. We must always be very careful what we listen to. We must listen to advice. We must seek recommendations from people whom we know. But we mustn't get anxious about this. And Jude says here that we praise God. We give praise to God because he is able to keep you from stumbling. And then the second thing he says in verse 24, he says, we give thanks to God because he's able to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. In other words, he says, God has begun a work of sanctification in our hearts. When you became a Christian, a number of things happened to you. You were forgiven all your sins. That has happened. You were brought out of the kingdom of darkness. That has happened. You were brought into the kingdom of God. That has happened. You were adopted into the family of God as a child of God. That has happened. You were justified, pronounced legally righteous. That has happened. So a number of things happened. And at the same time, when you became a Christian, a number of things began to, to happen in your life. Because the Holy Spirit of God came to live in you. 
the moment you became a Christian, the Holy Spirit of God came to live in you. And the Holy Spirit began to do certain things in you. And the primary work of the Holy Spirit, we really must understand this because there's an enormous amount of confusion with regard to the Holy Spirit and his work in a believer. The primary work of the Holy Spirit is to prepare us for heaven. That is why he has come to live in you. His primary work is not to give you gifts. Now, he does give gifts. But the reason he gives gifts is that you may use those gifts for the benefit of God's people, so that we as a company of God's people may together be being sanctified, perfected, being transformed into the image of Jesus. The gifts are not an end in and of themselves. The gifts are not there that we may boast how spiritual we are, how godly we are, and how close to Christ we are. That's an abuse of gifts. The gifts aren't there for us to show off. The gifts are there for us to use that all in the body of Christ might benefit and all in the body of Christ might make progress in their Christianity because the primary purpose for which the Holy Spirit came is to transform us into the image of Jesus Christ, to sanctify us, to perfect us, to get us ready for heaven. I've used the illustration of Esther before, and uh, you remember how I've said this before, that the book of Esther, I think, illustrates beautifully uh, this business about how the Holy Spirit does his work. Because in the book of Esther, you had this king, and he was looking for a bride. And they looked in the whole land, and they found this girl, Esther. And they brought her into the palace. Now, when they brought her into the palace, she wasn't fit to be married to the king. I always have this picture in my mind, and I don't know how accurate it is, that she was a land girl or something like that in some menial work somewhere. And she'd been soiled and she had, uh, you know, had been abused in all kinds of ways. And so she wasn't fit yet to be the king's bride. But they brought her into the palace. And the book of Esther says, for many months, the beauticians went to work. And these, of course, were experts, these beauticians. And they were preparing her. And it took months and months and months. And they were preparing her for that day when she will become the bride, when the king will come for her and she will be married to him and she will become his bride. So they began this process of preparing her. And I guess there were all kinds of beauty treatments taking place, her hair, her face, her eyelashes and so on. And they would work on her mannerisms so that she knew how to speak to a king. And they would walk, they, they would uh, deal with how she walked so that she, she walked in a way fitting for a queen. And they would uh, work on how she welcomed people and how she talked with people uh, and how she related to people, how she related to people who were below her, how she related to people who were above her, and so on. All these things, all this training taking place over months and months and months. And finally, at the end of that period, they looked at her and they said, she's fit to be a queen. And they took her to the king, and he was pleased with her. And there was a marriage ceremony, and he married her. And it's a lovely picture, you know, of what happens to us. Because like her, we were outside the palace. And like her, we're brought into the palace. And the intention is that one day there will be the wedding feast of the Lamb. And the Holy Spirit is, if I may call him, the divine beautician. 
this is what the Holy Spirit is doing in you. He is beautifying you. He is making you ready for the day when the bridegroom comes for the bride. And this is the language the Bible uses of uh, Jesus coming for his bride. You know this passage uh, in Ephesians, and Paul says he's writing to the husband, but then he speaks about Christ and the church. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. So in those verses, Paul writes about Christ's purpose for the church. Why does Christ love the church? Well, he loves the church because she is his bride. He has chosen to love this church. He has graciously chosen to love us. How does he express his love for us? Well, he dies for us. He gave himself up for us that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. And the Holy Spirit of God has come to live in us, that he might present us to the Lord Jesus one day blameless. Now, God's purposes can never be frustrated. If God has purposed to do something, it will get done. God's purposes can never be frustrated. This is what Jude is saying to his readers. He's saying to his readers, you are the church of Jesus Christ. You're the body of Christ. You're the bride of Christ. And Christ has purposed to save you from your sin. And Christ has purposed to take you to heaven with himself. And Christ has purposed that you'll be holy without spot or blemish or wrinkle or any such thing, blameless. And if Christ has purposed it, it will happen. And this is why he gives glory to God at the end of his letter. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. It's almost what Paul has been saying to the Ephesians. The language really is a distillation of what Paul has been saying to the Ephesians, to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. So there are people who are seeking to influence us. There are people whose theology is wrong, it's unbiblical, it's heretical. And they're out there and they're spreading their teaching. There are people whose practices are unbiblical. They're out there seeking to influence us. We must always be very, very careful. We must be on our guard. But we mustn't think that they will defeat us and they will defeat the purposes of God. They won't. Because God has purposed it or God has determined that he will present us blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. If you are a true believer today, you're a born again Christian, you've been born again by the Spirit of God, your sins have been washed away in the blood of Jesus, and you know that you're a child of God, when Jesus comes, you will be ready. Now you must certainly make sure that you are, you've certainly been given that duty, but the duty is not exclusively yours. We must keep in step with the Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit who is at work in us, preparing the bride for the day the bridegroom returns. And the bride is to keep in step with the Spirit and obey the impulses of the Spirit and the leading of the Spirit and the Word of God. But the Word of Comfort is there for us at the end of Jude, we will be ready. You mustn't be anxious about that. 
we will be ready. So Jude begins uh, this doxology, this praise to God by saying we praise him because he's able to keep you from stumbling and he will present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. And then in verse 25, he speaks about God himself. We have these wonderful promises in verse 24. He's able to keep us from stumbling, and he's going to present us blameless one day. Wonderful promise. Yes, but who has made these promises? You see, the promises are only as good as the person who made them. I can come to you today, and I can say to you, I promise to give you 10 million tomorrow. It's a wonderful promise, but you're not going to get it because I'm not able to do it. So is the person who is making the promises able to keep the promise? The promise is only as good as the maker of the promise. So Jude then in verse 25 explains that the one who has made the promises is able to keep those promises. He says, to the only God. There is one God. There's only one God. I know the world would like to say that there are many gods. There aren't many gods. There's only one God. Allah does not exist. Let's not be in any doubt about this. He only exists in the minds of the Muslims. In actual fact, in objective terms, there is no being out there called Allah. There is no such being. He doesn't exist. Paul tells us that in 1 Corinthians. And the Hindu gods don't exist. They don't exist. Ram and Shiva and Krishna and Vishnu, they don't exist. There is no such being out there. The Hindus may worship these gods and the Hindus may offer prayers to them and bring gifts to them and make promises to them and make prophecies about them. And it all sounds wonderful. There is no such thing as these Hindu gods. There is one God. That one God is the Father of the Lord, of, of, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and the, the one who has saved us from our sins and brought us into his kingdom, the one true living God. And he is sovereign. He's all-powerful. And so he is able to keep the promises to the only God. And then he goes on to say to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So he's not only God who is sovereign, but he is God who is our Savior. In other words, God has given himself this title of our Savior. Now, if God fails to do what he has given himself a title to do, well, that's terrible. You know, God says, I'm the savior of my people. I will save my people from their sins, and I will take them into heaven perfect. And then he fails to do all that. Well, that title is useless. But if God gives himself a title, then he lives up to that title, and he fulfills all the roles that are associated with that title. He is our savior. He has undertaken our salvation. He will save us from our sins. He will deliver us from this world of sin, and he will take us to heaven. And Jude goes on to remind them of the way it is done to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So we have God, the Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory to him. Because that is the means that God has chosen to save us. And Christ has done all that is necessary for our salvation. He lived a perfect life here on earth. He died on the cross of Calvary. He rose again from the dead. He today sits at the right hand of the Father. He will one day come back for his people. Christ is a sufficient, a powerful, and eternal Savior of his people. He does not fail. And so Jude's letter finishes with these words of praise. 
and he says, well, I've told you a number of things that are of concern that might cause you anxiety. But he says, I want to finish with this, with this reminder that God will keep you from stumbling and God will present you blameless before his glory one day because he is our God, he is our savior and he has done all that is necessary for our salvation. What I will say this, what I will say in closing then is this, please take the teaching of this letter very seriously. I know it's only a small letter. I know it's right at the end of the New Testament. I know it isn't as well known as Romans and Galatians and Ephesians. And I know it's quite a tough letter, but it is in the word of God. It is important. And there are people whom the devil has planted and they will be there in local churches and they will seek to bring in false teaching and false practices, and we must be on our guard. We mustn't make light of this letter. This is the word of God. We must take it seriously. So we mustn't make light of it. But neither must we then have sleepless nights and be so anxious and so worried. No, that's the purpose of the doxology. You see, it's to give balance. We must be concerned. We must be watchful. But we must always trust God that he will keep us from stumbling and he will present us blameless before his glory. Let's come to God in prayer. Let's pray together. Our Father, we do thank you for this doxology. We thank you, Lord, for the comfort it brings to us. We thank you especially that you are at work in us, transforming us into the image of Christ perfecting us, getting us ready for that day when our Savior will come. And our Father, we pray that we will keep in step with the Spirit. We pray that we will be those, Lord, who are making progress in our Christian lives. And our Father, we've learned much about false teachers in this letter. We pray that you would protect us, Lord. You would give us wisdom. You would guide us. You would help us, Lord, as we seek to access teaching that might do us good. Lord, bless us, we pray, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn is also some words of assurance. He will hold me fast.
Now let's pray. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God our Saviour, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. <laughs>